to have you here at Rock Lake Baptist Church. Hope you had a wonderful afternoon. Enjoyed the uh, cooler weather today. It's starting to feel a little more like Wisconsin in the fall. And I uh, hope you were able to enjoy that a little bit today. Uh, at least it's not raining and windy and frigid yet. And uh, we'll get there. But uh, we thank the Lord for the little bit of rain we did have uh, earlier this morning. All right, let's see. Hope you enjoyed uh, Pastor Lingle this morning. I really benefited from his message. I hope that was a blessing to you as well. And I just want to remind you that we are uh, taking a special love offering for these special speakers throughout the month of October. So if you'll just put it, uh, let's see, we designated it in the uh, bulletin here, mission speakers. If you just designate it as mission speakers, we'll know to put it into that offering for those individuals that come and uh, share with us throughout this month. Pastor James. Right. Yeah, the check needs to be written out to Rock Lake Baptist Church, but then designate on the envelope that that's what the gift is for. Yeah, if you write a check out to mission speakers, we're going to have to bring it back to you and have you rewrite a new check, okay? So write out your check to the church, but then designate on the envelope that is for the mission speaker. That will help us. Um, let's see, we are taking a missionary Christmas offering the last Sunday of October, which I believe is the 29th, if I remember my dates correctly. But the last Sunday of October is the fifth Sunday of the month, and we'll be taking a Christmas offering for our missionaries on that day as well. And we will be having our annual business meeting and fellowship on November 5th. So the first Sunday of November is when we will have a fellowship that evening. Um, there's a statement in the bulletin concerning the giving for the month of September, and we praise the Lord for that. And uh, God blesses when we obey him. And uh, I've always said, and I believe it, if all of God's people would tithe, the churches wouldn't be hurting for money. And uh, we, we praise the Lord for how God has used you to meet the needs here at Rock Lake Baptist Church. All right, I believe that is all of our announcements for this evening. Let's pray, and we will begin our service together. Lord, we are thankful to be here tonight to worship you. We are seeking to hear from you and your word. We pray that you would uh, bless our time together this evening, Lord, for eternity's sake. And we pray that you would help us to draw close to you as well as draw close to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray, dear God, that you would help us to be better equipped to evangelize the lost as a part of being here this evening. I pray that you would give us opportunities this week to speak with someone about you. Maybe someone who doesn't know you as Savior. Maybe someone who does know you or know about you, but they've, they've never grown spiritually, even though maybe they've accepted you as their own personal Savior. And I pray to God that you would give us those discipleship opportunities. Help us to have our eyes open to the opportunities. Help us to recognize them. And then, dear God, please give us the boldness we need to speak on your behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come ahead, brother. The first song we're going to sing is number 661. It's a very cool song, I think. Oh, Church, Arise. It, it's a song that points out um, the things that we already have in Christ as we fight our battle. The first verse is all about the armor of God and how God has already given us the armor of God to fight. The next verse we're going to sing is all about the cross and how our enemy is already defeated and that Christ rose again. And because of that, death has lost its sting. And the final verse is about the Holy Spirit and how God has given us the Spirit. But also, there are those who came before us that can tell us how the victory went and the, all the stories of those who came before us. So please stand as we sing, O Church Arise. <laughs>
This next one I picked because Pastor James was actually talking about it last week. And he was like, this is an awesome song. And normally we only sing the very first verse because we usually sing it as an invitation song. Um, so we're actually going to sing five verses tonight. Um, I'm not kidding. It's a very short song. So it's, it's very easy to go through. But it's an awesome song telling about how we, I think it's, it works great with this theme of the month of missions, that as we come to Christ, we need to be humble and realize that we are nothing and we need the Lamb of God. He is the thing that makes us everything that we are. <clears throat> for us, be thou my vision.
evening is not going to be necessarily quite as much a missions uh, message, but we will uh, get to the idea of giving the gospel, Lord willing, by the end this evening. Guys, if you'll go ahead and turn on the first slide there for me. Um, we're going to talk tonight about the ark, and uh, obviously uh, several of us, eight, 11 of our church folks, were able to go to the ark encounter, and I apologize, but I'm going to show you my pictures, okay? And uh, that's that mean, what that means is they're not going to be the most uh, artistically oriented photographs. They're going to be snapshots, okay, from a camera on my phone that my kids make fun of. So I apologize if some of you are better, much, much better photographers than me, no doubt. And uh, you'll say, why did he do it that way? Well, it's because I don't know what I'm doing. That's why, okay? So but I, I took some of the pictures of the things that I thought I would like to share with you uh, about our experience there. And uh, then we're going to uh, look at the Word of God and what it says about uh, the ark. And so I want to share with you what we saw. So here we are uh, getting ready to walk to the ark. And the way that they have it orchestrated, you know, it, you have to understand and appreciate that the ark encounter is similar to going to Disney World or Six Flags or uh, I grew up going to Kings Island in Cincinnati. One of these huge parks where thousands of people come in. And so they have us park in a parking lot and then everybody gets out of their cars and gets on a shuttle bus. And the shuttle bus actually drives through the 800 acres that they have there in order to get us up to the ark because they couldn't build a parking lot right around the ark. It just didn't, didn't work logistically. So they, they've built this as kind of a, uh, a park and the ark obviously is the biggest thing in the park. And uh, just to give you an idea of the perspective of how large this is, I took a couple pictures. So here is where we are starting to walk toward the ark. There's a picture that ha tried to capture the whole thing. And then if you can tell, what you're looking there is obviously the end of the ark. And those are the people getting ready to go into the ark. So that gives you an idea of how massive this structure really is. It is huge, <laughs> to use uh, the term that has, is often used to describe it. It is huge. As we were going in, they had this uh, monument there, and they said the 12 stones. And uh, they wrote a little bit about it. Um, when the nation of Israel crossed the River Jordan, they were told to erect a monument of 12 stones, one from each tribe. And the idea was to do it as a memorial. And so when your children come, the Word of God says, when the children come and say, what's this all about? What's this stack of stones? Then you rehearse the story. And uh, they took that idea and the, uh, the people who, uh, whose idea this Ark Encounter was uh, said, we want to memorialize what God has done in allowing us to build this structure. And so they, they put a memorial there. And everything done here, and this, I really appreciate this, at the Ark Encounter, it's not um, the attitude, I guess, is what I want to say. The attitude with which they put this together and they present it is not a glorification of any one individual. Um, most of you know that Ken Ham is the Answers in Genesis guy, and this was really his baby. For many years, he was raising the funds, but this is not about Ken Ham. Uh, he is not deified, if you will. All the glory is given to God, and I really appreciated that, and it's just the telling of the story of the scripture. Um, so we go inside the ark, and one of the first things you see is you go in the first, there's three stories or three decks as they've constructed it. Did, most, uh, did Noah have three decks on the ark? We don't know. Okay, a lot of it is, maybe it could have been this way, okay? And we went into the first deck and the lowest deck as if you've been on a cruise ship, you probably don't have access to the lower decks because lower decks are used for mechanical things. And here in Noah's Ark, as they recreated it, they said probably a lot of storage. And uh, it, was, it was interesting how many bottles and as you saw that you're like wow i guess you could lead feed a lot of animals and people for a long time if you had this kind of space for storage and then of course what you anticipate seeing is all the places where the animals were kept and they would have these signs there for you to look at and they would have a structure there just much like you would have in a zoo and they would have a fence between you and the animals and they did not have live animals in the ark encounter 
they had sculptures of animals. They did have live animals outside in a petting zoo, and uh, we never actually stopped at the petting zoo. I know, I know some of our folks probably did. My daughter, Hannah, who works there, loves the petting zoo, and she has had an opportunity to pet a sloth, which was like the ultimate thing on her agenda. And then also she said the wallaby is awesome. She said the wallaby is so soft. It's really, really neat. And they've got some pretty cool animals there. Um, but yeah, we saw a lot, of, a lot of plaques and cages, okay? So this was one that fascinated me. I thought this was really cool because one of the questions that I've had is um, how did they deal with the ferocious animals, right? And uh, I don't know how well you can see that, but what they've got in there is a, a type of bear and uh, an idea of how they might have dealt with one of these animals that could be dangerous to a human being. And uh, what you've got is the man, and I, I did not catch the identification with the, whether this was Sham Hem or Japheth, uh, but anyway, they have, they have a guy up there and he's pouring food down a tube into the cage where the bear can eat it. So the bear can't access him, but he can get the food and water to him. And so uh, once again, in the cages, they would have a sign outside. And uh, if you remember, uh, we will read the passage in just a minute, but do you just help me out off of your memory, because I know most of you are very familiar with the story of Noah and the ark. How many animals did Noah take on the ark? Two of every kind except the clean animals. So two of every kind, and this is one of the things that you need to wrap your mind around, you should understand, because people will often say, there's no way he could have had every kind of dog and every kind of cat, etc. Well, no, he had to have two of every kind. And so each one of these cages, they've got two of a different kind of animal. And with all the science and technology we have today and studying DNA and genetics and all this kind of stuff, they can determine whether or not horses and donkeys are actually related. And guess what they are? And an easy way, we had a biologist there who gave us a little uh, conversation and, and a lecture, and, and he said one of the easiest way to tell whether or not animals are of the same kind is if they can reproduce. And so you say, well, a cat can't reproduce with a lion, a, a domestic cat, house cat, can't reproduce with a lion, so they can't be the same kind. Well, yeah, they can be from the same kind because a lion can reproduce with a leopard, which is much smaller. A leopard can reproduce with another cat, which is much smaller, which can then reproduce with a house cat. They are one kind. And so one set of mom and dad out of that kind can actually, over generations, they have the genetic DNA to produce not only the lion, but also the house cat. And uh, that was explained to us, and of course they do it a lot more scientifically than I do because I'm not a scientist, but it was pretty easy to understand. Uh, and uh, my pictures, I apologize once again for the quality. A lot of times it was quite crowded, although it was not the most crowded it ever is on the Ark Encounter, but many times I couldn't actually get up to the cage but I would stick my phone up above everybody else and take a picture, okay? And so that's the reason for some of this. So this was uh, some kind of, uh, if I remember correctly, this was whatever they said that the rhinoceros would have come from was uh, what they had put in there. And these, of course, are conceptualized. Uh, these would have been the giraffe uh, uh, ancestors, and uh, they were smaller than a giraffe after having been to South Africa and seeing the wild giraffes out, out there that are 17 feet tall. Um, yeah, these were a lot smaller than that. Um, so then they would also have informational placards and they were, would ask questions and try to answer those questions, okay? So one of the questions is what were the largest animals on the ark? And obviously the answer to that would be some of the dinosaurs, okay? Were there dinosaurs on the ark? We believe that yes, there were dinosaurs on the ark. We don't believe they went extinct until after the flood. So, um, they only needed two of each dinosaur. And one of the obvious things that people ask is there's, you know, one of the objections that a skeptic might put up there is there's no way that you could fit elephants in these dinosaurs that were so massive and giraffes onto a boat with all the other animals of the world. They're just too big. And the obvious answer is you don't have to think very long. God probably did not send adult animals to Noah. 
he probably sent them juveniles of the dinosaurs as well as the larger animals like the elephants and things like that. Because number one, they're smaller, they take less food. Number two, they produce less waste. Number three, once they got off the ark, they had a longer lifetime in which to reproduce and have more offspring. So it just makes sense. And if we can think of that, I think God probably had that figured out too. There were a whole lot of animals that Noah did not have to take on the ark. Anything that lives in the sea doesn't have to be on the ark. He didn't have to bring a lot of fish with him, okay? So that was not a challenge. There were a lot of animals, and if you know much about sea creatures, I, I love the ocean. I love the, the, it seems almost infinite, the varieties of animals that live in the ocean. And uh, Noah didn't have to preserve them because they were in the water. The pig kind, I, I took a picture of this one. I read this one. I thought it was very interesting. They said of most animals over the past 4,000 years, which is roughly how long it's been since the flood, if you believe the Bible, and I do, it, uh, most animals have changed quite dramatically. Some of you have seen animals change in your own lifetime. Do you realize that like 50 years ago, there was no such thing as a labradoodle? It was a mistake, <laughs> okay? It's, it's very easy to have new species, if you will, uh, created over hundreds of years. Well, it's been 4,000 years since Noah landed on top of Mount Ararat, and the pig is one of those animals that even in the fossil record has not changed all that much. I thought that was very interesting. It gives a whole new connotation to the idea of being pig-headed in my mind. So this was another one interesting, and I did not discuss this with my wife. Um, can you imagine what's in those jars? They have a little net over the top. That was where they kept the reptiles, okay? Or other things that might be poisonous. And once again, it's just an idea, but it's logical. And so they had a hole in the bottom uh, through which they could wash it out uh, without having to take the animal out. They had uh, a system for feeding them and everything where they would never have to take the cover off. And I thought, yeah, that makes kind of good sense, especially for something that could hurt you or kill you. Uh, this is an informational sign. I know you can't read it, but uh, this was very helpful because it, it, it pointed out, obviously, what they built in the 2000s is not the same as what Noah built 4,000 years ago. Everybody knows that. And some of those obvious differences that they, they say we need to understand this uh, the ark, as Noah built it, was built to preserve the life of roughly eight people and however many hundreds of animals. The ark encounter ark was built as a building to have thousands of people walk through it. And so they have obviously a lot less of the animal spaces built inside this ark model. Um, they have elevators, they have bathrooms, and they have very, very long ramps that everybody was thankful for because we didn't have to climb up several floors of stairs. Well, obviously Noah would not have built it that way. The ramps that they used would have been able, the animals would have been able to climb the ramp, but they would have been much shorter and taken up a whole lot less space. The center of the Ark Encounter is basically ramps going from one deck to the next deck very long gradual ramps that are easy to walk up and uh, that's for people movement which Noah didn't have to worry about and several other things that he makes a point about uh, he they ask questions was the ark shaped like a box some people are confused because the scripture only gives three dimensions well a three-dimensional object only has three measurements it was not a shoe box okay and uh, they go through and describe some of the uh, reasons for the way that they built it the way they did Oh boy, I can't even read that one anymore. Um, oh, water and waste. One of the big questions that they have, especially people that deal with maintenance issues in large buildings and things, is how do they deal with water? How do they make sure they have fresh water? How did they handle the waste from all the animals? Because that's what animals do. And uh, they answered a lot of those questions, uh, once again, through the placards. And once again, this, these were our ideas and our understanding 
and uh, I shouldn't say ours, I said today's people, okay, our generation of brilliant minds understand how they could make this work using what they had in those days and in accordance with how it's described in the Bible. Lighting, this was an interesting one. How did they light the inside of the ark? Well, obviously today they have all kinds of lights going through their electricity. It was air conditioned, okay? Heating and air conditioning in there. I doubt that Noah had that. Uh, they probably didn't value that as much as I do. Um, but the, uh, the lighting in those, in the ark in that time, obviously we would have skylights built in and then probably carrying portable lanterns most of the time for their lighting. This was kind of cool. They uh, replicated what the door to the ark might have been like, and they would have you go stand there, and you can see that if you can identify, those are a couple of our church people, uh, Carl and Dee and Jean and Debbie, standing there in front of the ark, and my camera didn't picture it as well as some, captured as well as some, but they actually have a lighted cross up there above the door, and uh, they put a really big emphasis on how Christ is the door. And uh, there's actually a track that they created based on that. This was one of the more interesting areas to me. And that was they uh, tried to recreate what the living quarters might have been like for Noah and his family. And I really liked this concept. They had a bed built there on the wall, but then they also had a hammock. Now, I haven't spent the night on a boat, but a few times. And I bet there are some nights when it's a lot more comfortable to be in a hammock <laughs> than to be fastened to the wall. I don't know. James could probably tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, he spent months on a submarine. But uh, they had hammocks as well as those. And I thought, yeah, I, I bet I'd probably go for that hammock quite often when it was a rough, rough, rough night. So there's a picture looking down. And I know you, I can't capture it on a camera. But to give you an idea of how long it was from one end to the other, that's from one end of the arc looking down the center of the ark, and you see all the light in the picture. That light is primarily coming down through the skylights in the center at the top of the ark. And uh, how did they measure? Well, they used a cubit. What's a cubit? A cubit is a difference from a distance from the tip of your finger to your elbow. And uh, we've got some nurses in here. What is the uh, vein that you try to use when you give somebody an IV? What's it called? Oh, there's a lot of them? Oh, okay. I thought there was just one. I'm sorry. I thought there was, I don't know anything. <laughs> but they, they, they actually still have the name cubit in one of those scientific names for one of the veins in your arm that goes in the forearm. And it still has the cubitus, I think was what it said, as part of one of the veins that goes in that portion of your arm. And uh, that distance is what was used in the Bible was a cubit. Well, in different cultures, there were different sizes of people. And so the cubit could be 17 inches, a cubit could be 22 inches, depending on how tall the individual is and how big their bones are. So how did they decide? Well, they just picked one, basically, okay? They picked one of the shorter, actually, cubit lengths that they know was used in ancient times, and it was 20.4 inches, and that's what they used as the cubit for building the ark encounter. So that was very interesting. How large was the ark? So this, this ark uh, replica that they made is 510 feet from one end to the other. Um, let's see if I can get a close enough read. 51 feet tall and 85 feet wide, okay? And those of you that are good at conceptualizing that, then now you know exactly how big it was. They also had a model there because like I said, there were differences, obvious differences that had to be made in order to have an Ark Encounter as a tourist place as opposed to actually some place to keep all those animals. And so they built a small replica showing you the inside of what they conceptualized as being more accurate even than the Ark Encounter itself. Um, some of the displays were very neat because they would have people in there, obviously Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth and their wives, and uh, they reconstructed different little workshops that they might have had and that kind of stuff. and. Uh, there, in, as you read your Bible, you will see that they worked with metal long before Noah came on the scene. And so people imagine, oh, Noah had to build all that stuff with just wood mallets. And no, no, that's not true. And uh, we vastly underestimate the intelligence of ancient man. And most likely they had 
a blacksmithy type setup there to work on tools that they would use in building the ark. Um, for those of you that are shipbuilders or carpentry people, you would probably have been fascinated by going into the bow and the stern and seeing all the carved beams, uh, curved beams that they had. And uh, I, I know very little about woodworking, but I know it is an art. And uh, this, was, this was pretty amazing. It was beautiful wood that they had put together there. But then they had a sign, look up. And the point was, we were standing on the bottom deck, and by looking up, you could see all the way to the top of the ark on the inside, and you could see all the skylights where the light was coming from. And so I took the obligatory picture there. They actually had a little spot on the floor where you stand here to take your picture. So I did. <laughs> After we got done walking through the ark, uh, they also had um, different lectures and things at different times. Hannah is there as part of a, uh, a drama, and uh, we, I didn't take any pictures of that, but um, that's a different show, if you will. Many times when you go to the amusement parks, you'll have different shows at different times. Well, they had a lot of different, I'm going to use the word show, but that's not what they were. Um, but for, for Hannah's thing, it was a drama and a reenactment of uh, some Christians from Russia. Uh, but anyway, we went to this one that afternoon, and it was fascinating to me because it presented something that I had never heard much about, and that is what do Christian scientists believe about the Ice Age? And basically what has been put forward by our Christians that our scientists is that most likely the ice age was a one of the repercussions of the flood it did not last millions of years and there's easy ways to explain why that is true uh, but it did happen and actually I, I learned some things okay some of you have lived here for all your life and you may already know this because you probably went to fourth grade history class and learned all about wisconsin but I didn't have that because I grew up in Indiana, okay? So the Glacial Drumlin Trail, everybody know what that is? Anybody know what that is? Okay, it's right, it goes right here through Lake Mills. Well, what was explained to me, well, that's where a glacier came through. I'm like, okay, whatever. And they eventually built a railroad track on it, and then they took out the railroad track, and now it's a bike path, and it goes for miles and miles. You can bike like 25 miles or something like that on it. Well, okay, cool. Drumlin is actually a word related to glaciers. And it has to do with one of the places, I think, where it like paused on its movement or something, and it made a level line across the land. And that's why they chose it to put down a railroad track there, because they didn't have to deal with hills. They could go in a straight line. And then when they took out the railroad track, it's a really cool place to ride a bike, because you don't have to on the hills, but it was formed by an actual glacier. Another thing that is here in Wisconsin is the Kettle Moraine Forest. Okay, a moraine. I never knew what a moraine was. A moraine is where the glacier stops, and then as it melts, it goes back the other direction, because those glaciers gl gradually slid across the earth, but eventually they melted. Well, when they stopped sliding, they left a ridge of land that's called a moraine and that's why we have the kettle moraine park system and forests and all that kind of stuff because that is where the glacier stopped but I, I never knew all that i learned all that on this trip so just history and science and stuff they had their this guy is a biologist and he told us he said i'm a biologist not a theologian somebody asked him some question and he said i don't know <laughs> he said, you'd have to ask the theologian guys. I, I'm, a, I'm a biologist. I'm a scientist. And he had a lot of fossils that are from right there in Kentucky. And uh, this was one of them. It's the skull of something that's related to a llama or whatever. And he was explaining to us how they could tell by the teeth structure that it was or was not part of the llama and camel families and all this kind of stuff. And I was just like, wow, that is so cool. I had no idea. I didn't know that kind of stuff. Well, he taught us a lot of really cool things. So I took some pictures and I want to share them with you. The largest land mammal that lived in the United States of America, we were not the United States of America, okay? <laughs> this is right after the flood during the Ice Age. Um, this thing 
oh, I wish I could zoom in, but you see the little, st the little doll there of a guy? He would be six foot tall. This animal, which if I remember correctly, was related, it was either to the elephants or to the rhinoceros, I don't remember which, but anyway, it was, it was, it's in the same family as one of those. They have actual fossils that they have duplicated and they realize how this thing lived where we live in the Midwest. And that was pretty cool. And he said, you could actually walk under it. A grown man could walk under it because it was so mammoth. Now it was not a predator. This was a grazing type animal, but nevertheless, wow, so cool. Uh, he showed us a couple other animals that were here right after the flood. Um, some of you that have watched the Disney movie Ice Age may recognize the one on the left, uh, or the right, excuse me, the one on the right. Um, but anyways, that is a type of the armadillo family. Kind of creepy. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. It was, I mean, can you imagine having an animal that big? burrowing in your yard. Um, <laughs> that's what the armadillos do. And uh, so anyway, that was one of the animals that they have fossils of today. And the thing on the other side of that man there was the bear. They called it a cave bear. And they have many, many, many um, skeletons of the cave bears because they lived in caves and died in caves. And they have a bunch of them across Europe, they said. But uh, they would stand roughly six feet tall at the shoulder, which means when they stand on their hind legs, they're taller than this roof. They're like 20 feet tall. That's a big animal. I'm glad the bears we have today aren't quite that big. But um, scientifically what happened is when the glaciers melted and uh, at that time, immediately after the flood, they believe that most of the earth was almost like jungle, hot, because of all the heat that was in the oceans. As, as we'll read in just a minute, the fountains of the deep broke open, which means molten lava, right? Hot. So that heated the world's water. And that water would have stayed warm for a long time, and they believe that created over much of the earth right after the flood, warm space for animals to live animals that thrived in wetlands and that kind of stuff. And then on the top of the earth, the northern hemisphere was the ice age, basically. And uh, as that normalized again, the ice would melt and the oceans would cool down. And it changed the topography over the past 4,000 years to what we have today. This was another cool fossil that he had there. And I put my hand in the picture because I wanted to get you an idea of how big this was. I was almost touching it. Okay. I was about this far away. I, he told us not to touch anything. So I didn't touch it, but if I put my hand up there so you could see, you see how big my hand is. This was the claw of a sloth that lived in the Midwest, a three toed sloth that lived in the Midwest. Now, it's this long, okay? That was a massive animal. They said it was about 2,500 pounds. 2,500 pounds is the weight of a large horse, okay? That's a big sloth. Now, thankfully, they weren't going around chasing people and eating them. Sloths don't do that. But nevertheless, there's a uh, picture of perhaps what they called it. They actually call this one, if you look up the scientific name for it, it's like mega something Jeffersoni. Jefferson I.I. Because Thomas Jefferson actually wrote about these things because they had discovered them just a few hundred years ago. And uh, so they named this one actually after Thomas Jefferson because he described them in some of his writings. Massive animals that lived in the Midwest and would intimidate me anyway. So I learned a lot. And uh, if you ever get a chance to go to the Ark Encounter, I would encourage you to do so. It is fascinating. Genesis chapter 6, if you would with me, I want you to read you the account from the scripture that all this is about. And then we're going to look at two more passages that talk about it. And although those are not the only places in scripture where it is mentioned, I think that will be more than enough for tonight. So if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 6, 
I'm going to start reading there at the beginning of the chapter. And I'm just going to read, and I'm not going to live a, give a lot of commentary until we're done reading, okay? When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they choose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Now it's very possible, and one of the understandings of this passage is that at this point in time, God said it's going to be 120 years until... I take them out. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. So I guess I was wrong. There are third, three decks. I, I thought that was conjecture, but it's actually written in scripture. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring the flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. And that was an interesting thing. They had a question there on one of the placards. Did Noah have to bring insects? And the brief answer is no, he didn't. He didn't have to worry about that. Well, number one, God might have sent them and they would just live the way they live. Nobody takes care of the insects. You don't have to feed and water them. They find their own way. But also they breathe through exoskeletons. They don't have the breath of life in them. They don't have lungs like we do. So it's very possible that God just said, no, you don't have to worry about those. You're going to take care of the animals that have the breath of life in them. And God could have preserved them by having them live on algae, living on other animals, whatever. Anyway, just one of those things that they mentioned. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two. Let's, oh, excuse me, I skipped a couple verses. Um, there we go. Uh, everything that is on the earth shall die. And picking up that next verse, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household. For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and his mate, a pair of, an a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate, and seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days... I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth, and Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Of clean animals and of animals that are not clean, and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground, Two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah as God commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. 
In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life, died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. 150 days, they rode out the storm. One of the things that they did very well at the Ark Encounter was to portray the gospel using the Ark. And one of the points that they're very emphatic about is that the cartoon pictures of Noah's Ark and the cute little toys that you get do not depict accurately what the ark was. Number one, it's, it's not even feasible that the animals would be so huge that they're protruding out of the, a boat that can hardly hold them. Secondly, this is not a, an entertaining children's story. Everything died. Every person died, except those in the ark. God's judgment came down on man, came down on the whole earth. It's not a fairy tale. It's very sad. But the salvation of mankind is what we can be excited about. And what God did by having Noah build an ark was he provided a way of escape for those who were willing to trust him. For those who were willing to obey him, God made a way of escape. Very, very few people, only eight, took advantage of that. Out of thousands upon thousands upon thousands, probably millions of people that were alive on the earth on that day. Only eight survived because only eight took God at his word. Chapter 8, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the waters of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, and the waters continued to abate until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountain tops were seen. So it's been 150 days, and finally the ark stops moving, and then the waters start to recede, and they're looking out the windows of the ark, and they're able to see the tops of the mountains. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made and set forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her feet. 
her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a, was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth. 601st year, what does that mean? Where did you get 601 years? Is that from creation? That's the age of Noah, 601 years old. 601st years in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you of all flesh, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. Then, God, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. You can get very concerned about global warming, climate change, whatever you want to call it, but the fact of the matter, God has said, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will not cease until, until God destroys it all again with fire. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I give you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your life blood. I will require a reckoning from every beast. I will require it and from man, from his fellow man. I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. <coughs> and you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. For it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth when I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh when the bow is in the clouds I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. When you see that rainbow, <clears throat> I hope you will remember that that is God's promise. That he is not going to react to man's wickedness again with a flood that destroys the earth. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And it is God reminding himself to hold back his judgment.
Turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 11. I want to read a passage there, and then one more passage after this. Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to go to verse 7. Most of you know Hebrews 11 is the heroes of faith. We call it the hall of faith. It is a listing of people that the writer of the book of Hebrews says we should realize and learn from their faith how we ought to live our lives. It says in verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. There's one more passage that I'm not going to read to you. I'll just mention it to you. Peter talks about, excuse me, Jesus talks about, you can turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 if you'd like with me. We're going to look at one more passage there. But Jesus is talking about the coming of the Son of Man, which is when Jesus comes again to judge the earth. And he said it's going to be like the days of Noah. It says people are going to be getting married. They're going to be going about their business with no inkling that God is going to do something. And when somebody tells you, I heard recently, somebody's announced once again the end of the earth, the end of the time, God's going to come back, God's going to destroy everything, and they announced the time. I don't know if it's passed yet or not. It was like this year sometime. When they say that, you can say baloney, okay? Because Jesus very emphatically said, only God the Father knows, and it's not given to any man to know, not even the Son of Man, not even Jesus himself at that moment in time, knew the specific day and the hour when he's going to come back to judge the earth. So if somebody tells you a date, they're wrong. You can just write it down, okay? <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 3. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved, and both of them I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the, pred the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles knowing this first of all that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires they will say where is the promise of his coming for ever since the fathers fell asleep all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation for they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water, that means flooded with water, and perished. But by the same word, the word of God, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Second Peter chapter 3 talks about today. When the Bible refers to the last days, it's talking about the days in which we live. Paul the Apostle said that he was living in the last days. Okay, as we view time, that means that therefore we are even farther into, farther along in the last days. And Peter says, in the last days, people are going to say, God did not create the world. And God did not send a flood. He says they are, what does it say here? They deliberately overlook this fact. 
I'm not a scientist, but I've been to places like Mammoth Cave, which is phenomenal. I've been to places like Niagara Falls. I've been to the Grand Canyon. And I've seen some of the amazing things on this earth that those who reject the notion of God say took millions and millions of years to happen. And almost every time I've had an opportunity to ask the tour guide or whoever's giving the speech, is it possible that what we're looking at today could have been formed by a worldwide flood? And almost every time that tour guide or person has said, yes, that is another way this could have happened. The scientists know it. The people who teach it know that the word of God has told us a logical, understandable way in which the world that we live in today came to be about. But they willingly overlook it. They deliberately ignore it because they don't want to answer to our God. You need to be aware of that as a believer. That's the situation that we live in. We know that God destroyed the earth with a flood, and the earth we live in today is a sin-cursed earth since the time of Adam and Eve. But the world is not going to acknowledge that fact. So what do we say to the world? We give them the gospel. We do what Noah did. He said, that's the way of salvation. That ark, if you'll come with me on the ark, you won't be destroyed. God is going to send a flood and destroy the whole world. And nobody believed him except for his own family. And God sent the flood and God destroyed the world. God is going to punish every sinner. And if our friends and our neighbors... And our family members do not accept Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. They will pay for their sins. Just like all those people were destroyed at one time with the flood. We have a message to carry, don't we? We have something to say. We have a message of hope. We have a message of deliverance. We know that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, is the only way of escape from the penalty for our sins. We should feel a burden to tell our loved ones and to tell everyone we meet about Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we are amazed as we study your word and some of us had the, the opportunity this week to go down to the Ark Encounter and see how some of these things probably happened. We know that it definitely did happen. We just don't know exactly, you know, everything about how Noah built the ark. But we understand that it's true and we understand that it's real and we understand that it was by this that you delivered mankind even though you destroyed everybody who was alive in that day except Noah and his family. Lord, we realize we have a singular message that is as unique and unfamiliar to the world around us as Noah and his ark were to those around the, him. I thank you for Ken Ham and the Answers in Genesis organization that had the vision to put this together to give us an education and understanding, a greater understanding of your word and how they've been very careful as best they can to follow your word as they put this together to give us an idea of what it might have been like. And I pray to God that you would help us to be strengthened and emboldened and to have more understanding so that we can talk with people who disagree with us so that we can give reasonable answers for questions that are raised. Lord, we know that your word is not unreasonable. We know that you are not unreasonable. 
we know that we fall short of understanding everything. I pray to God that you would help us to accept by faith that which we do not understand of your word and that we will live in obedience to you no matter what. Help us, dear God, to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ with those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Got another song? All right. We'll close with a song. I'm just going to close with two verses of I Surrender All. Please stand as we sing.